Today, let's improve our hand synchronization and picking speed by working through this dope neoclassical etude in the style of Michael Romeo. I currently have a very scared puppy on my lap because we're having a thunderstorm. You gonna be okay, turkey? Yeah. Hey there kids and welcome to a brand new installment of Weekend Wake Shop, here with your good buddy, Uncle Ben. Today's neoclassical style etude is in the style of one Michael Romeo of Symphony X, one of my favorite roughly shirt guitar players of all time, right up there with Yahweh Mouse Meat and of course Francis Bubble Trousers. It's all based around an alternate picking phrase that I stumbled across last week and have been obsessed with ever since. It's a great phrase to add into your shred soloing and it's also just a killer warm up to work on your hand synchronization and alternate picking speed especially if you practice it along with the backing tracks, downloadable tabs, and guitar profiles that I'm putting up over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Sign up today even for just a buck a month. You're going to get access to all that stuff as well as a ton of backing tracks, bonus lessons, and so much more. So don't delay. Sign up today. Gear-wise for today's video, I'm going to be playing my Ibanez RGT3120, one of my favorite guitars of all time. And I'm playing that today through my Synergy rig. I'm using the Friedman BEDLX model into the UA Aux. Yeah, let's hear that furious lick again at stepdad speed. All right, meow, first things first, this is in the key of A minor. It takes place in two different octaves, and we're gonna be using four different pockets of six notes each. Let's walk through those first. First one right here walks up the scale starting off on A. Next one goes down a note in the scale here to G. Going down the scale here to F. And then the last one takes place down here on E. We're going to be using those same boxes an octave up as well, starting off here on the B string fret number 10. So here's our A minor shape. Here's the G shape. The F shape. Something, something about your mom likes the F shape. Then the E shape. Okay, so phrasing wise, there's a long lick, a short lick, and then the long lick again. Something, something about your mom liking the long lick the best. Anyway, so the phrasing idea that this is based around is one that I kind of stumbled across last week. It sounds like this. I kind of like that phrasing because it doesn't just walk straight up the scale. It kind of teases with that middle note and then goes up to the high note later. I like that phrase, so I wanted to use it in something, which is how we got to this video. Okay, so the long phrase is going to walk up each of those boxes like this. 
again, that is what I'm calling the long phrase. After this, we're gonna play the short phrase. That was more straightforward. You just walk up the scale to the fifth note and then back. And then you play the long phrase again. So all together you got long, short, long. Let me do that one more time. After that, play the exact same idea, only in the second box of notes, the one that starts here on G. One more time. Then down to F, same phrasing idea. And then lastly, the E one, which cuts itself short and leaves a little space at the end of the measure. So let's play that all again one more time here in the low octave. After this, we're gonna play all the same stuff, but starting off in the high octave instead. So same phrasing, same shapes, all that jazz, just starting off on the B and E strings. Let's try the whole thing a little more fastlier. Two, three, four. So that was a few different ways that you could phrase that long lick and short lick together. Because the cool thing about this is, if you phrase it in such a way that you have the long lick twice and the short lick once, you can put them together in any sequence that you want to, and it'll work itself out to be one measure of straight 16th notes. So you could play this in a way that goes long, long, short, and that would work out. You could go short, long, long. If you're going to be wearing that phrase out, you might as well change up the phrasing a little bit to make it less predictable for the listener. I always find with sequence licks, whenever the listener can hear the pattern, it's kind of like the illusion is broken, so to speak. So it's always important to change those phrases up whenever you're playing those sequence licks. There's a couple things you can do here with your left hand to make this easier as well. Especially when you're playing in the low octave, this has some pretty big stretches going on in there. I recommend keeping that thumb on the you know middle section of the neck. Try not to ride it too high in that mangle it and strangle it position. That's great for some stuff. I'm not saying never do that. But for big stretchy licks like this down low, you're really going to limit your range if you have that thumb high up on the back of the neck. Part of the reason for that is simply the fact that whenever you have the thumb high up like this, odds are the palm is resting on the edge of the neck as well. Now whenever you have the palm resting on the edge of the neck, you'll notice it puts the fingertips way above the strings. So that means whenever you want to actually get them to the strings to play the gortar, 
you're going to end up cutting your length in half, which is, of course, no good. If you're like me, you don't necessarily have a lot of length to spare, so you're going to want to use every bit that you can. So I want you to focus not only on placing the thumb lower on the neck, but just in general placing the palm lower than the side of the fretboard like that. Whenever you have the palm an inch or so away from the edge of the neck like that, you put the fingertips right there on the strings and you can use their maximum length for maximum impact. There's also a left hand muting trick I want to show you guys to help you get this up to maximum speed and sound super clean. So the tricky thing about this phrase is that it is a two-way pick slanting phrase. It features string changes off of down strokes and string changes off of up strokes like that last one. It's always kind of an outside picking affair, but you're still having to change off of both downstrokes and upstrokes, so it's inherently kind of a two-way pick slanting thing. Now, for a lot of us, we tend to favor one or the other. I've mainly been a downward pick slanting guy myself for most of my life, so it's a little easier for me to do the changes off of the upstrokes, but some of you guys might find that the downstroke changes are easy and the upstroke changes are the tricky part. If that's the case, then this can end up happening. You can hear right there that whenever I'm doing the upstroke change on the G string right there, I'm kind of accidentally smacking the D string as well. I see this all the time with players. And uh, one thing you can do to prevent that is to play a little bit of damage control with the left hand. Now, of course, ultimately you want to build up the control to where you can get that upstroke leaping over that D string, or if you're playing the high octave, leaping over the B string. So that way you get above it to hit the next note without actually impacting it on the way there. But while you're building up that control, you still want to sound cool and clean. So what I recommend doing is using a little bit of left hand fingertip muting with the first finger. Check out the position I've got going on right here with my left hand. Whenever I play the G string, I'm not just gonna put my first finger tip right there on the G. I'm gonna fret a little bit more on the fingerprint. That way the fingertip itself is slightly blotting out that D string. You can see I'm just barely slightly touching it right there. By having that little bit of muting going on with the first finger, that means if you accidentally hit the D string with that upstroke, like I just did, you won't hear it. See, if I change the position of that first finger right now, you'd hear that D string every time. with that little bit of first finger fingertip muting going on like that, you didn't hear it at all. And I was hitting the D string every single time there. So it's really all about playing damage control with the left hand. That way the right hand can just go crazy and work on those alternate picking speeds. So give it a shot, just the tip, just to see how it feels. I bet you'll like it. There you go guys, a great neoclassical style etude and a phrasing concept you can use all over the place. Keep in mind, you can use that long, short, long phrasing idea anywhere that you have three notes and three notes. So even if it's like your typical, you know, blue scale kind of idea, you could use it there too. And get some cool sounds out of it. So use this phrase in your playing and let me know how it goes for you. You're going to get even more out of this video if you head on over to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Sign up even for just a buck a month. That's going to get you access to the guitar profiles that go along with this lesson, the backing tracks that I'm putting up at a multitude of different tempos, the downloadable tab, and a ton of other bonus lessons. So don't delay. Sign up today. Be sure to let me know in the comments section what technique you would like to see an A2 devoted to next here on my channel, and I'll get to that in a future installment of Weekend Wank Shop. Thanks as always for watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and ring the bell down there for notifications every time I upload a new slice of fried gold right here on my channel. Well guys, it's been fun as always, but I recommend getting away from the computer machine, grabbing that guitar, and getting to work. Let's clickin'. More pickin'.